You may not have been around where something that wasn't equitable was created, a law was passed, or you weren't here when certain people came over to Canada or to the US and migrated, right? So it's not your fault. There's no fault here, right? But you, we all are responsible for what we do with the data that's in front of us now. And, and I think that that is the game changer, right? That's what I've seen in when we talk to people, when you can allow people to understand that cognitively there's two things happening at the same time, that it's okay and let's talk about it. I think then it, it just creates a different conversation for us to, to, to think about this work a little bit different. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My name is Anthony Taylor. I'm the managing partner at SME Strategy. We facilitate strategic planning sessions and help organizations get to where they want to go. And today, I'm very excited to welcome our guest, Jorge Quezada. Jorge, what's happening today? Oh, I'll tell you what, feeling good, being thankful. It's a great week here in the U.S. Uh, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving. So um, thankful is, is the word that I'm feeling right now. Excellent. I got that. You get Thanksgiving, you got to eat, you get to be with family, lots yeah. of good stuff. Um, so I'm excited to chat with you. So for everyone listening at home, uh, Ori is the VP of Inclusive Diversity at Granite Construction. He's got a, a lots of corporate experience doing a lot of cool things with people. But Ori, why don't, I, why don't you tell our listeners, you know, what does your average day, week, month look like and, and how did you get to where you are right now? You know, it's a great question, Anthony, because um, what you're making me do is you're making me expand my thinking in, in a lot of ways, because when I think about what I do in a given day, week, month or so forth, um, I really feel like I teach people to notice. I think that is the operative word for me. I think we live in a world today that we all reside in our own individual echo chambers. And so we're used to just talking or being around people that are just like us because we create it because it's safe because it's comfortable uh, but in the work that i do around inclusive diversity and, and, and at granite we're very intentional about calling it inclusive diversity because we want people to be inclusive of all the diversity so if you think about that cognitively if we want you to be inclusive of all the diversity then we need you to get out of your comfort zone and so in order to get out of your comfort zone sometimes what you have to do is you have to notice things that maybe you're just not used to noticing. So in a very simple way, I, I think that's the first thing that I do. And so um, my job is to influence, my job is to teach, my job is to just have conversations with people about what the terminology of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sometimes it feels very esoteric for people. You know, it's sometimes it's maybe it's consultant speak, sometimes it's just a department speak. But when you start getting into the conversations about what diversity is, what we mean about equity, what we mean about inclusion, what we mean about belonging, sometimes you, you get to the moment where you realize, wait a minute, people haven't heard these terms in the way we want them to practice them. So we go from notice, we go from having someone have good intent in their heart and in their mind and have them take that intent and create action to make impact. So... In, in your question, like I said, you 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 challenge me to expand normally what I talk about, but yeah, I would tell you that in those things, um, noticing and taking people from intent to impact, I think that's what I do. That's awesome. Well, getting them to recognize, and I really like the notice, the first step to impact, and I'm I'm sure there's a framework there. Um, so one of the things I I thought about noticing as you were explaining it is, it takes time to notice. It takes intentionality to notice. Um, in the construction world, you know, like one of the big core values is safety. Like you have to be aware of your surroundings. You have to like recognize stuff and you can't be moving too fast to potentially miss something harmful. So going, talking about noticing, uh, how can leaders, like how can leaders take time to notice? How can they step back? What's a practice they can put in place? And maybe what are some of the practices you've put in place either in Granite or some of the past uh, organizations that you've worked with? Yeah, I love that question, you know, because safety at Granite is one of our core values and so is inclusion. And so the transition into answering your question would be, you know, you ask people to slow down, but in a lot of ways, what you're trying to do is you're trying to ask people to literally 
take away what they have learned, put it to the side, and to learn what's important for that moment right now. Mm. Because I think, let's use continue down the path of safety and I'll transition to the inclusion part. Um, we all think we know we're safe. We all think we're like we could be safe at a job site, but every job site is not the same. So there's a paradox there of the prox the processes, the practices, the things that we want people to do are all the same processes. So there's sameness there, but the, the ground could be different. The grade could be different. The tools that you're using could be different. And so what you have to do is you have to make this, this cognitive like decision to say, I'm gonna listen with the beginner's mind. And so the transition here is when, when I hear, when, when someone asks me a question like that about leaders, I think leaders, I think, first of all, as people, we all think we're good people, okay? So, um, but being a good person is relative. Um, you know, there are good people like Mother Teresa who sacrificed everything in her life and she helped people, right? And then there's good people that end up in prison somehow because the, the, the choices they made, but they were all good people. And so the reason why I say you got to start with the beginners in mind is I think you have to take this work and you have to just acknowledge that you don't know everything. Just because you're, you, you have defined yourself as a good person doesn't mean you know how to be a good person towards me. And so the, the nuance when I say we want people to notice, and yes, you're spot on, Anthony, um, you have to take time. You, you can't treat people the way you want to be treated, like the golden rule. You have to treat people the way they want to be treated. And we as practitioners label that as the platinum rule. So you have to transcend from trying to ask people to be like you to actually taking that step to be open to say, how do I reach out to Anthony and ask him how he wants to be treated today? And, and that is a, is a game changer in the way you engage people. You know, I, I think someone like, um, if you go back, you, you hit pause and rewind, and you think of Blanchard, right? Kenneth Blanchard, and he wrote The One Minute Manager. And then he, he taught us about situational leadership too in his own framework. What he was doing was he was asking us to really learn people for who they are and identify the best way to engage with them and get the best out of them. And I think leaders have to think about that. We've, we have the tools around us. It's just that sometimes in, in our fast paced world, we create shortcuts. Sometimes it's through our biases or sometimes it's to experience that we think are the same in the moment that we were involved in. And all of a sudden you realize just like in a work site, wait a minute, something is different about this conversation that I'm having that I have to pivot and do something different. So, so yes, yeah, safety and inclusion challenges us to step back and have a beginner's mind. Yeah. And I think what's it's what's interesting about that is going back to the the approaching the world with a beginner's mind, and one might say like, "Oh, this diversity inclusion stuff is new. Like, how do I do it?" And then I would challenge everybody listening: It's like you already know how to do it. You just need to apply the same learning that you got with like not being a jerk to other people and say, "Actually, no. Like, let's see if, if I'm doing it inclusively." I really like the the platinum rule, uh, and I wrote down like unlearning. You know, like unlearn habits, and it's one of the conversations we talk about diversity inclusion. But I think mm -hmm. that's going to eventually, kind of hopefully, eventually just meld operationalize into working with more diverse um, workforces, and yes. then basically say, hey, how can I accommodate? I don't want to call it like multicultural. It's not that, but different people have different needs. They have different understandings. They have different backgrounds, and they have different like. Uh, I don't want to say experience, they have a different experience of life. Me as a white guy does not have uh, the same experience as a Chicano, does not have the same experience as somebody who is black, brown, or otherwise. It's yeah. not the same. So you can't share your perspective and put it on them. And then going back to the, back, the baseline of what's acceptable from a people standpoint. I know that was a lot of stuff, but I'm trying to summarize. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think you're onto something there. I, I think, first of all, as men, right, you and I are individuals, but we're part of a group. We call ourselves men, right? And, and, and we engage in that conversation. Until something changes, you and I can feel comfortable just talking about guy stuff. Hmm. But you bring a woman into the room, we have to notice that there's a woman in the room and our actions have to be different. 
I think where some people make the mistake is just that they keep going down this path of having the same conversation, you know, let's call it male talk for the, just for the purposes of our discussion here. And we don't acknowledge the woman in the room. And then as we're having a conversation, did we notice that the person said, my partner, um, did the person, my wife, and all of a sudden one of us says, hey, so how are you and your husband doing or your boyfriend? And we didn't notice, we didn't hear. Um, and those are the kinds of things that, it, you know, it's, it's challenging because I think when you ask someone to have a beginner's mind, they, they, some people go to the point of like, we want them to be little kids again. No, that's not, that's not what we're saying. We're, we're basically, what we're saying is, listen, start from ground one, you know, step one. Don't assume that you know everything in the room that's in front of you. Um, ask questions, get engaged. And I think that is the moment of truth, right? You could have, you can notice, but not take action. You could have intent and not have impact. And I think those are the kinds of things that in this work, we're challenging people, you know, you can't be an ally if you never take action. You can't be an ally if all you do is have good, good intentions in your heart and in your mind. You actually have to act on it. And so, yeah, there was a lot of things in there, but I, I think you're onto something. Hey, sorry to interrupt. It's Anthony here again. I just wanted to let you know if you're enjoying today's episode, I'd love it if you could give us a review and a comment to let us know where you're listening from. It means a lot to us. It helps us with the algorithm. It also helps us get into the hands of more people so that we can keep bringing great guests onto the show. So please do that. Also, if you or your team are planning a strategic planning offsite coming up, please reach out to us. We'd be happy to see if we're a fit to facilitate, to support you and your team getting on the same page and getting clear about where you want to go. So you can visit smestrategy.net or click the link in the description. We'd appreciate both of those things. And now get us back to the episode. One of the points I was trying to put it together mm -hmm. when we talk about diversity and inclusion and as for white people or anybody else, because you could be, you know, diversely, um, is that there's like this idea of like defensiveness. And I call it the defensiveness because I think a lot of the some of the context or some of the interpretation is I am wrong, I have to change. How I'm doing stuff is not correct, which is the distinction between, hey, if you approach everything as a beginner, you would say, okay, I've got like so much to learn here. And through this learning, I can improve. I can be a better manager. I can be a better person. I can have better results. Like there's a, a huge on the ROI of this, like mm -hmm. so to try to take that selflessness out of there, yeah. but yeah, sh shaping the lens of inclusivity versus you're doing something wrong to, hey, there's a way that you could approach this differently in this uh, new way of doing business. Much like you had to adapt to using Zoom, you have to adapt to having diverse workforces and, and people being more, dare I say, vocal about their needs and concerns, which is a great thing. I don't know how to say that in a different way, but I yeah. that's what I mean. You know, so in our podcast, right, Construction DEI Talks, uh, Stephanie Roldan and I, and Abby Combs, um, she's she's out on family leave right now, but she's coming back. Um, we just interviewed a woman by the name of Vicki O'Leary, and she um, works for one of the trades. And she said something to us that was really profound because she said that she realized that she had to stop telling people what not to say or what not to do and giving them the room and recognizing them for the things that they were doing really well. And, and I share that with you, you know, in your context there, because she has a, a, a son who, uh, uh, with special needs. And she learned that in order for, for, her, her, uh, for her to communicate with, with them, she needed to recognize them doing things right, not necessarily telling them, no, don't do this, don't do that. And, and as you were talking that, you know, our episode with Vicky came to mind because there are four paradoxes that I, I would love for your audience just to, to really just sit with. The first one I shared with you was we're all individuals, but we're part of a group. So those two things reside together, right? Another one would be when it comes to this work, it's okay to support, but also be there to challenge because that's where you learn. Okay. So you have to have both. Um, there is sameness that's necessary for us to, like, from a, from a bias perspective, get to know each other so that we could overcome our differences, right? So there's sameness, and then there's difference. 
And then the final one, and this is why I wanted to share these paradoxes with you, is, is that you may not have been around where something that wasn't equitable was created, a law was passed, or you weren't here when certain um, um, people came over to Canada or to the US and migrated, right? Um, so it's not your fault. There's no fault here, right? But you, we all are responsible for what we do with the data that's in front of us now. And, and I think that that is the game changer. Like right? that's what I've seen in when we talk to people, when you can allow people to understand that cognitively there's two things happening at the same time, um, that it's okay and let's talk about it. I think then it, it just creates a different conversation for us to, to, to think about this work a little bit different. But to your point about we got to sometimes we have to stop this. Don't say that word. Um, don't do that. Don't do that because then that defensiveness pops up, right? Because it seems like it's only being directed at one group of people. But in actuality, bias, um, the isms impact us all. That makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. So going back to those, the cognitive uh, yep. balance, individuals and part of a group, you have to support while challenging there's sameness and differences. And then there's like how you respond to things. And I think the key part of the, all of that is if you're existing with these two worlds, um, taking the time to, to discuss them and bring uh, what we call the, uh, uh, implied to explicit, being able to talk through them, work through them in a safe space. So I guess my next question is, yep. you know, as somebody who has set this up for large companies and small companies, mm -hmm. you know, what are two or three practices that leadership teams can take to have these conversations in, in a safe space? And I want to kind of uh, preface it by saying, you know, it's, it's not the, the diversity inclusion guys coming in, like, you know, those like old school HR workshop, HR yeah. is coming in to talk to us about this. How can organizations foster it so it's a, a benefit to everybody that they want to do it, they prioritize it versus something that they have to do because it's been mandated by HR? Yeah, so just, so thank you for that because I could take you, and, and, and I hate like minimizing it to three things, but somehow I got connected with if you keep it to three things, people will pay attention kind of thing. But three things um, leaders could do. You can even start doing this today. You could do it. If you're in the U.S. at Thanksgiving, if you know, if you're in another part of the world, you could do it by the next time you engage. Okay. The first one is find a way to give the other person a voice. And in diversity, equity, and inclusion, the way we say it is give the quietest person in the room a voice. So when you go into a meeting, when you go into a Zoom, and you have the 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 boxes, who's the person who's not participating? And without being so overt about calling them out, be able to say. Hey, Anthony, I know you have a lot of ideas. I can see the, the, the wheels spinning. As we're having this conversation, what are your thoughts about what we're talking about now? Now you brought the person into the room. You've given that person a voice. And if the person says, you know what, I'm still processing, say, thank you. I just want to make sure that you were included in the conversation. So you give the quietest person in the room a voice. The second thing, and it gets back to the noticing, give the person who looks, who you're feeling is different in your group, make them feel that they belong. Somehow bring them into the mix, just like the voice, bring them into the mix. And then the last part, and this came, I tell you, you know, now that, I, that I'm thinking and saying it to you, we were doing some work, some diagnostic work, and I encourage anyone that's trying to prop up and based on your question, this type of practice in a company, um, to do a diagnostic of what problem, what thing are you trying to solve for? And at Kraft, one of the things that was happening at the time was, this was at a time when we were talking about millennials, 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 millennials. Everything was about millennials. New millennials are coming. We got to get ready for the millennials and so forth. And as I was interviewing some of the folks at, at Kraft, they were telling me that they didn't feel like they belong or included because every discussion was about millennials. And they felt like their work product didn't matter anymore. Their ideas didn't matter anymore. And so the third thing is, regardless of age, regardless of how new the person is into the company, find a way to acknowledge their contribution. 
So give the person in the, the quietest person in the room a voice. The person who looks like, feels like most different, make, make them feel like they belong or have them feel like they belong. And the third one is regardless of tenure, you know, whether it's age or new to the company or you know, tenure within a company, have their work feel like they can contribute. Those three things. I really like that. And, you know, the, as you explained this, the second one um, was, you know, when you're at a party, like when you have somebody who doesn't know anybody, a good host basically says, hey, like, come on in. Like, I want you to talk to to this person. And, oh, you two have this thing in common so that they don't feel they are on the outskirts. And the other thing is kind of exhausting. It's, it's super exhausting for people that have been fighting for their own uh, wanting this to be seen to take up that fight all the time. And so I call it a fight because sometimes it occurs as that. Mm -hmm. So like having other people bring that in and say, hey, there is actually a sameness um, and, and creating that commonality between everybody. Um, and then I really like the bringing everybody into a room, especially as there's more and more digital communications, it's easier and easier to air quotes, forget people. Um, as facilitators, we make sure that there's a diversity of voice because well, that's what we get paid to do. Yes. Um, anything else you wanna add on, on that from a practical standpoint? No, I think I think I like the I like the way you 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 partnered it up at a party because that's the classic example. If if you know you you feel uncomfortable at work, well think about where you do feel comfortable. There are some people who act differently at work than they do at home, and sometimes those people that are great hosts at a party are doing the very thing. And I think earlier you said it right. We have these tools. We have these ways of making people feel comfortable. It, it's almost like if you're bringing someone new to dinner and you don't make it a point of introducing themselves, but you allow them to do all the introducing, like it's gonna be difficult for them. And then they're gonna feel funky and don't be shocked if they've never come to your party again, right? Because you made them not feel included or feeling like they belong. Yeah, I was at a party recently where I was like, you know, you sit there in the corner, you're on your phone, you're just like, hi, I'm with this person. Like, uh, it's part of onboarding. It's part of welcoming people into teams. And even if they've been at the company for a while, a new team is new team. So building that psychological safety quickly and early is gonna help them onboard it, feel safe, feel comfortable, better productivity. They're gonna get to work better. And at the end of the day, we're just all skeletons with like magic skeletons that walk around. So everybody's basically the same. We just have different life experiences. Yes, and that goes back, <laughs> back to that paradox, right? There's sameness and difference. And, and you just yeah. have to notice the difference. Absolutely. So as we begin to wrap up here, I'm yep. going to ask you a question. You need to dig back into that. What yep. in your career, like you've been doing this a while, you've got a lot yep. of experience. What was something that like, was like a, like a big aha moment. And like, it's kind of a cliche, but what was one of those things you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I just learned this today. It usually comes from either a mistake or something that screwed up or went poorly. Typically it's like a, a, a hard lesson that you had to learn. So what was a hard lesson that you had to learn in your career that is really formative in, in shaping either the work you do now or, you know, your career path in general? So, um, I appreciate the question because I'm going to be a little vulnerable here, right? Um, so when I started this work, I, I have 20 years of business experience at Allstate. I was asked to take on this work because I'm a person of color. I have you know, was the president of the professional Latino Allstate Network. And it was just a great transition for me to do this work for Allstate. And so I was passionate about the work, but didn't really know the work. So there's the art and science of this that then I gave myself time to really learn the work, you know, step on the shoulders of giants like, you know, Howard Ross, Andres Tapia, Jennifer Brown, Ted Childs. I can go on and on, you know, Judy Kratz, you know, um, I'm thinking of these people that just taught me so much about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Fast forward, I'm at, um, I'm at Kraft, and I'm, I, I talked about the interviewing that I was doing, and it's paid tremendous dividends when I went to Northwestern Mutual. And now that I'm at Granite Construction, um, it was, it was, I didn't even think about it. I just knew that it needed to happen. White men at Kraft were not connected to the diversity, equity, and inclusion work. Some of them, because of their intent, wanted to do things for it. But at that time, at the people that I was interviewing, I want to be very specific, was the people that I was interviewing. They were telling me, listen, um, this work is only about people of color and women. 
Um, I've been kept on the sidelines. And the only time you come and tell me I need to be engaged in this work is when you give me a number that we need to hit around representation. When I heard that data, right? When I heard those data points, I realized, wow, did my passion for this work exclude bringing in white men to this conversation? And when you ask that question, I wanna share with you that that was the moment that I realized that diversity, equity, inclusion is for all. Mm -hmm. Even in the word inclusion, in the middle of the word inclusion is the word us. And that's why here at Granite, we were very intentional about calling it inclusive diversity. We wanted to make sure that people were inclusive of the diversity that we have at Granite today and celebrate that diversity today, tomorrow, and into the future. And then it was about all of us because the science will tell us, right? Diversity, like every company has 100% diversity. We just don't call it out that way because we, we are challenged to put people in boxes. So when we say we don't have enough of this box, this box, this box, that's where we get into the number stuff. But if we get into the number stuff and dismiss the majority in certain companies of the people that need to be engaged in this conversation, then we're dismissing you know, white men who are gay. We're dismissing white men that are divorced. We're dismissing white men with kids, no kids. I mean, this I, I share that with you because that was the aha for me, that I could not continue this work if I wasn't inclusive of all, of all of us. So, so thank you for that question um, because it just uh, allows me to uh, think back about a moment in time where, where the work really amplified what I needed to do. Mm, no, I really like that. One of the things that we talk about as when we do strategic planning is we talk about the importance of, of looking at your stakeholders. Now, you've got a lot of stakeholders, you've got a lot of people, and there's the ones with like high influence and, and high power that you want to engage with, but they're all stakeholders. And so like in this context, diversity inclusion, you need to have all of your stakeholders at the table to have representation to, um, and not token representation, but really just to make sure you've got everybody on board, because if it's going to be an organizational initiative, you can't do it without the whole organization behind it. Uh, even though it's, and the irony of it is the people that you think that you're doing it like for, you're not actually bringing them to the table to contribute. And that's the thing stalling what's moving forward. Like they will resist it, which is super ironic in its sense. Well, and, and you know, if I, if I could, um, you know, it's been interesting in the last two years, I, I could take you back to a podcast I was on early 2020, right when COVID hit. A lot of companies were, how do I say it? were letting go of their DNI departments. They were letting go of leaders because of an expense issue, maybe. Don't know. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, fast forward a couple of months and the tragedy here in the US of George Floyd happened. And I can't tell you how many companies have started with the EEI programs, bringing in new people. And, and there's a change formula. I know you're familiar with it. I think Dan Miller, she's the, the one that put it all together. Um, but it, it basically says that change will only happen if the dissatisfaction multiplied by the vision, multiplied by actionable first steps is greater than the resistance that mm. you're experiencing. And, and I jumped on that because you used the word resistance. After George, the tragedy of George Floyd, I think there was internal dissatisfaction that was greater than any resistance. The, the, the issue is, is this, is, we're still trying to figure out that some companies are still trying to figure out the vision of what this will look like and what are some actionable first steps. And that's why I like, you know, when, when, when you ask the question, what are some actionable things that people could do, right? Because mm -hmm. it gives you that first step. But if there's resistance, you have to find out why there's that resistance. And for me, I, I realized that by not including all of our stakeholders, and we can use that to define other things, right? But what happens is the very people that we need to be mentors and sponsors were the very people that were on the sidelines. You can't play the game if the people that you need to move the ball forward down the pitch, down the football field, and whatever analogy you want to use are not in the game, right? right. So you have to be very, very in, have impact because of that intention. So, so that's, I guess, how I, I just wanted to follow up on that. 
No, I love that. I appreciate that. I, I tell people in my own quotables, the benefit of the future needs to be greater than the pain of change, which is mm. like a simplified version of the formula. And then if you want to expand it, like Cotter's change framework. But the point of that is that you really need to make sure you have the right ingredients uh, to be able to move that change forward. Um, and I think that that's critical to any corporate initiative and especially any DE&I inclusion and, and, and basically everything we've been talking about today. Um, uh, where can people get a hold of you? Where can they learn more about your podcast and where can they just connect and make a new friend? Well, thank you so much. Uh, if people want to reach me out directly, the best way is through LinkedIn. You can find me at Jorge A. Quesada MBA. That's the way it's, it, it's titled. Um, you can listen to our podcast as construction DEI talks, all one word. Um, you can find us on Apple or wherever you listen to um, podcasts. And then we also have our website that has captured all of our episodes up to this point. It's construction DEI talks.com. Awesome. Thanks for it. It's been a blast chatting with you today. I really appreciate it. Uh, to start chatting and getting to connect. There you go, Anthony. Thank you so much for the time. Oh, my pleasure. So everyone, you know, taking the stuff that Jorge shared is really saying, you know, yes, it's applicable to um, the DE&I work, but really applies to everything you want to move your organization forward. And as we move into 2022, like all of these initiatives are going to be critical through a great period of disruption. So I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. If you did, be sure to rate it five stars on iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. Uh, subscribe to us on YouTube and just stay connected and drop a comment and say what's up. Um, and then be sure to connect with Jorge um, on LinkedIn. So uh, my name is Anthony Taylor. I want to thank again our guest, Jorge Quesada, who is the VP of Inclusive Diversity at Granite Construction. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. This has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. See you next time.